I'm wearing a jacket, but th that might go soon. I'm reluctant to take it off because the one church I pastored a few years ago in England, I preached one Sabbath without a jacket, and it caused so much alarm it became an agenda item on the elders' meeting. We will be merciful to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll see how we go. We'll see how we how we do. Something seems missing. There's a lot of people missing, but something seems missing today. And I, I'm just sitting thinking, what is it? Every Sabbath we hear it. Every Sabbath it comes out. And it's missing today. So Shabbat here you go. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Our pastor is not here today. And um, sometimes you you miss things that when they're not there, you do miss them. So happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Today we're continuing... Um, our theme of Touching the Untouchable Part 2. Last week, we, um, I shared a story with you about a man who was touched by, by Jesus. A desperate man, the leper, touched by Jesus Messiah. Today, we're going to continue that theme. But today, we're going to be looking not at a man who was touched by Jesus, but today we will look at a woman who reached out and she touched Jesus. Because he is the one who can touch the untouchable. Yes, we too can reach out and touch the Messiah. And anybody who has told you that Jesus is untouchable, I hope I can persuade you otherwise this morning. Before we begin, I want to share an update with you. Last week I um, presented to you this slide Remember who these, these boys were? The, the 12 boys and their teacher or their soccer coach who were caught in a cave um, in Thailand. The monsoon rains came, the cave filled with water, and these uh, poor boys for nine days were missing. And for nine days the world held its breath. Were they alive or had the worst happened? Um, shadows of the Chilean miners five years ago. And finally, as we said last week, the, the great news was, um, I'm, I'm going to be proud today to be English, because being English this week has been hard. Yeah. <laughs> Please do not mention the word Croatia. <laughs> Somebody sent me a, a message this week, and it says, it's amazing how much you can miss something when one month ago you had no hope. <laughs> Um, some late nights this week and a lot of um, sadness in my household. But anyway, um, we will be watching tomorrow and supporting Croatia because as an Englishman we can't possibly support the French. <laughs> Korea, this would be like um, Japan being in the final. No chance. No. Croatia. And that's okay because my wife's best friend in England and my daughter's best friend in England, they're from Croatia. And we've spent um, twice in the last four years we've been to Croatia. Beautiful country, small, four million people, four million people in Croatia. We, we did a mission program at Murusovic, which is the Adventist college in um, near Zagreb in Croatia. So we have an affiliation, a, 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 some love towards Croatia, so we'll be rooting for them tomorrow. Anyway, let's get back to these boys in the cave. Where are we going with that? Nowhere. Um, these boys in the cave, I'm, why, why am I proud of English? I'm proud because the divers who found them were British. Amen. They flew them over from London. They were specialists in this area, and the, the heartwarming story was these British divers came across nine days later, these boys, all alive in an air-pocketed part of the cave, Hungry, but alive. And then last week we said the tragedy was that because of the, the monsoon rains, they were saying that these boys would possibly have to stay till October in the cave. But tragically, during the course of this week, the waters began to rise and the divers said, it is now or never that we get these boys out. The boys couldn't swim. The boys had never dived before. The, the divers said this would take five years of training to do this type of dive and they had literally five minutes to prepare the boys. 
And as you followed the news this week, one by one, it took seven hours to get there, seven hours to get back. But one by one, over a course of three days, every single boy was brought out alive from that cave. And you know, we have news every day, it's always bad news. Um, always bad news. Nuclear war, famine, disease. So this week, it has gripped me again, and it has warmed my heart that there is hope. That Jesus Christ today still performs miracles. And here are the uh, boys uh, just a few days ago waiting to uh, be released. And now all 12 of them are in hospital. Um, but there is still a little sadness to the story because we're talking about this story because of touch. The, the children, because they've been so long, 14 days in this cave, susceptible to disease and infection, they're in an isolated ward in the hospital and the images of the parents, I couldn't find an image, but the image of the parents looking behind a glass window at their children and just raising their hand to the glass, desperate to touch, to hold, to hug their children who they thought possibly they would never see again. But praise God, they're alive and well and Jesus still performs miracles. Amen. I need my helper. We have a scripture I want to read with you today and I thought it would be good for you as students to hear some real British English. <laughs> And uh, my helper today has the most beautiful and perfect English accent. Whoa. Better than her dad. <laughs> so she's going to share with you the, um, the scripture this morning. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Beautifully read. <laughs> What a story. What a story. We're going to unpack it today and try to see this concept of Jesus Messiah touching the untouchable. I read, I don't do Facebook. Often students and people say, I can't find you on Facebook. You won't find me on Facebook because I'm not there. I used to do Facebook. I collected about 4,000 friends. It's like collecting stamps. <laughs> Just collecting friends. And then in the end, I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> and somebody told me to remove on Facebook the people I'd never met before, so I did that. And then somebody told me to remove the friends on there I've only met once and will probably never meet again. I did that. Then they told me to remove the people on there that you're not really friends and actually you don't. No, I'm not going to say what I should say. So I removed them. And it went on and on and on. Then remove the people who you don't trust or the people you... And I did this exercise. And in the end, I was left with five people. <laughs> my wife, my mom, my dad, my best friend and my nephew. So I thought I'd get rid of it. So I'm not on Facebook, but when I was on Facebook, every day you're bombarded with um, 
pictures and images and infographics, and one of these um, really stood out 